Hi, welcome to Multivariable Calculus. Today we'll be talking about limits and continuity. I am, as always, Professor Clark. Just to start with just a quick review of calculus, think back, what were some of the big ideas that you learned in Calculus 1 and Calculus 2? I'll give you a second to think about this. Maybe you even want to pause the video. You might have came up with uh, derivatives and integrals. And I would argue that derivatives and integrals are two of the fundamental ideas that you would have learned in Calculus 1 and Calculus 2. And, um, of course, this is talking about limits and continuity. That Maybe those weren't on your list. Um, but one of the things that's important is the notion of limit and continuity actually are um, the foundational ideas that help you get to derivatives and integrals. And when we get to... Uh, derivatives and integrals later in the course, we'll need to have a sort of a foundational knowledge of limits as well because of course the derivative and the integral is defined in terms of a limit. Um, we're not going to get into the serious mathematical technicalities here, although you could take a real analysis course if you're interested in them, just enough to get us to where we want to go in this course. So let's motivate this study with a, with a brief example. Let's take two functions. Uh, f of x, y equals 1 over x squared plus y squared, and g of x, y equals uh, sine of x squared plus y squared divided by x squared plus y squared. What do they have in common? How are they different? And uh, if you think about it for a minute, you might notice that both of these functions are undefined at 0, 0. If I, if I evaluate f at 0, 0, I'll get 1 divided by 0, which is undefined, and similarly with g. Although in this case, I'll have the sine of 0, which is 0, divided by 0. So I get 0 over 0 in this case, and 1 over 0 in this case. So they're both undefined at 0, 0, but in slightly different ways. So maybe that's a one way that they differ. Um, so what we might be interested in is, what's can we quantify that difference? What's the behavior of the function near the point 0, 0? So mathematically, we can write this using limit notation. Uh, so we say the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 of the function f of x, y equals, and uh, we don't know what it is. And similarly, we could evaluate this with g of x, y. So one way we can explore limits is to uh, use um, a graphical program. So um, here is the function 1 over x squared plus y squared. And you'll see it's kind of a nice looking function, but at 0, 0, it seems like we've got a problem. It's blowing up. So as x and y approach 0, 0, the values of the function uh, increase without bound. We might say go to infinity. Uh, if we switch this to the function sine of x squared plus y squared divided by x squared plus y squared, we see something different. So here's the graph, also kind of an interesting looking function. But in this case, um, as the point x, y, so here maybe this is my trace point, um, as the point x, y approaches 0, 0, instead of blowing up, I'm approaching what looks to be maybe 1. Here, the, y, the z value is equal to 1 at the point 0, 0, although technically the function isn't even defined at 0, 0. Um, as you can see, when I put the trace point at 0, it disappears from the graph. So the function's not defined at 0, 0. But in some sense, it wants to be defined at 0, 0, and it wants to be 1. And that's what uh, the notion of the limit really wants to get at. So we'd like to say that this limit for f of x, y is infinity or doesn't exist. And we'd like to say that this limit for this function is equal to 1. Um, so one of the things you might remember from earlier calculus courses is there's different kinds of limits. So in this case, let's talk about three types. So type one, the limit exists and you can compute it using the rules. So let's say you've got two functions. Um, this function limit as AB is equal to L. This limit as XY approaches AB is equal to M. So you got two functions. Uh, what are the ways you can combine two functions? Well, you can add or subtract them. And if the limit of F and the limit of G both exist, as real numbers L and M, then if you add the two functions, then the limits are just added. If you subtract them, they're just subtracted. If you multiply a function by a constant, then the limit is multiplied by the constant. If you multiply two functions, the limits are multiplied. 
if you divide two functions, the limits are divided, uh, provided that the limit of the g function is not zero, of course. And you can do things like take powers and um, uh, things like that. So these kind of rules assume if limits exist, you can you know combine functions together. And this will allow us to handle a number of cases, but not every case. Uh, the second thing that can happen is the limit doesn't exist. And if this is the case, well, you often will show it use, show that it doesn't exist using the two path test. So this is a theorem and analysis. Uh, if f of x, y approaches two different values as x, y approaches a, b along two different paths in the domain of f, then we say that the limit does not exist, or it, it actually implies that the limit does not exist. So let's see this using this example here. Here's a nice function. It appears to be defined as long as the denominator is not zero. Uh, for the denominator to be zero, you'd have to have, uh, this is a non-negative term, this is non-negative, so you'd have to have both of these be zero. In other words, this function is defined everywhere except for at the point zero, zero. So what, uh, what is the limit as x, y approaches zero, zero? Could we, f could we actually make this into a complete function by putting a single value in at 0, 0 like we could have done with this sine function. If we just define this, this function here to be 1 at 0, we could actually fill in that hole and have the function be defined everywhere. Could we do something like that for this problem? And the answer is no, and we'll use the two-path test to prove it. So how might we consider this? So let's show that the limit doesn't exist. So we need two paths. So let's consider a simple path say along the y-axis, which means setting x equal to zero. So what happens when x, y approaches zero, zero uh, along the y-axis? So x is zero, so it's really just this limit. And if x is zero, then zero to the eighth would be zero. So it's really just the limit now as y approaches zero. Only one thing is changing in this case. y is approaching zero. And well, you just get y squared over y squared, which is one. So the limit as y approaches 0 of the 1 function is just 1. Uh, the y's basically cancel, and it doesn't matter the fact that y is getting close to 0. It's still 1. Well, now we could try something else. Let's take the path along the x-axis towards 0, 0. So let's say y is equal to 0. Well, when we take that limit, same function, this time we're on the y, we're on the x-axis, so the y-coordinate is 0. So if we include zeros in here and here, we get this function. So for any value of x that isn't zero, you'll have something here. And so we have zero divided by some number, zero divided by any number is zero. It doesn't matter what that number is. This quotient is always zero, and therefore the limit of the zero constant function will be zero. So in the domain, when we approach zero, zero along the line x equals zero, we get one number. And when we approach it using the x-axis, when y is 0, we get a different number. So those are two different numbers. The limit wants to be two different things, so there must not be a single value for the limit. In fact, we can try other things, too. So just for fun, consider the path when y is equal to x to the fourth. So um, if x is approaching 0, x to the fourth will also approach 0, so y will be forced to go 0. So we're sort of just approaching 0, 0 along this curve. And what happens if we do that? <clears throat> so in this case, x is approaching 0, y will approach 0 because y will be x to the 4th, so we really have this limit. If y is equal to x to the 4th, x to the 4th squared is x to the 8th, so we get this. So on the numerator, we have 1x to the 8th. On the bottom, we have 2x to the 8th. Um, as long as x is not 0, which it isn't in the limit, this will just be 1 half, and so we have a limit of a bunch of 1 halves, so that makes 1 half. So we get all different values depending on what trajectory we take to arrive at 0, 0. So that tells us the limit doesn't exist. Uh, how could you explain this graphically or numerically? Well, let me bring up this function here. So if we zoom in close to 0, what we can see here is we have this sort of crease happening it's trying to take on a lot of different values. It's trying to be 0 at 0, 0, but it's also trying to be 1 at 0, 0. Uh, the function is trying to be multi-valued. In fact, it's probably trying to take every number between 0 and 1 on. If you pick uh, a different point, 
you know, there's going to be limits at, for instance, 1, 1, there's going to be a limit. But when you approach 0, if I come along the y-axis, you'll see it saying, oh, I want to be 1, I want to be 1, I want to be 1. But if you come along the x-axis, it's saying, no, I want to be 0, I want to be 0, I want to be 0. Um, if we come along the line y equals x, we might get something else, depending on, you know, what path we take to get there. <coughs> There's a third type, uh, a type where the limit does exist, but finding the limit is difficult, requires the use of a computer or some, you know, super clever algebra tricks. Uh, again, you can take real analysis if you like these kind of more difficult problems. For our purposes, we probably won't bother with this too much. We'll do a few simpler algebra examples, and that'll, that'll be it. The main concept is getting a sense of, yes, you can take limits in, in uh, higher dimensional functions, and uh, it, so that we can use that to move towards the calculus that we're interested in. The next thing I would like to talk about is continuity. Um, continuity is a often sort of forgotten topic in, in calculus, but it's really important. It's a foundational topic. A lot of the theorems we prove are going to have a provision, well, suppose the function is continuous. If it's not continuous, then this isn't true anymore kind of thing. So we do need to have a definition of continuity. It will get used later in the course, um, and so keep that in mind. So what is the definition? Well, we say a function is continuous at a point if the function is defined at the point, the limit at that point exists, and the two values agree. So it's really two things. You need a function value, you need a limit, and the two things have to agree. If those things exist at AB, we say it's continuous at AB, uh, and usually we want a function not to be continuous at a single point, but to com be continuous at a lot of different points, so maybe on an entire domain. So it's continuous on its entire domain. Um, that's really helpful. All right, so let's try to do a few more limit problems, and, and that'll be the end of it. Uh, evaluate the limit or determine that the limit doesn't exist. So let's, let's think about this function here. Uh, let's plug in 1, 3 and see what happens. Uh, if y is 3, that's 9 minus 9, so we get 0 in the numerator. This will be 2 times 1 times 3 is 6, minus 6 times 1. Uh, so we get 0 over 0. So this limit may or may not exist. The function's not defined at 1, comma 3. So maybe we'll consider this function its graph. Um, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. Here, let me find the point 1, 3. That's here. Oh, okay, so it looks to me like uh, the function does seem to be nicely behaved at least near 1, 3. So I'm guessing that there is a limit. So let's see if we can find the limit. How would we do that? Well, let's try some algebra. So let's factor this numerator here. That could be y minus 3, y plus 3. We can factor the denominator. There's an x and a 2. So we factor out a 2x, that leaves y minus 3. And um, so as long as y is not equal to 3, then we can uh, cancel this out. Now, if y is equal to 3, that number's not in the domain. So in some sense, y equals 3 is not in the domain of the function, so that should never be a problem. Anywhere in the domain where this is happening, we can factor that out, and that leaves us with this. So what happens now as x and y approach 1, 3 for this function? Well, y is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, uh, 2 times 1. So essentially, this is just a nice linear function. That limit exists. This is a nice linear function. That limit exists. So we can divide by the two limits and uh, use our limit rules, and we end up with 6 over 2 is 3. So it must be approaching 3, and a little bit of algebra gets us there. Here's a question. So where is this function continuous? All right. Uh, the numerator looks to be defined everywhere. Uh, the denominator isn't necessarily defined everywhere. It's only defined uh, when the inside of the radical is non-negative. However, since you're dividing by that number, we don't want to divide by 0, so we need the, inter the inside of the radical to be positive. So in other words, it looks like it's a combination of continuous functions. It should be continuous as long as it's defined, but it's only defined on its domain, which would be um, 
the points in the disk of radius root 5, so any points where x squared plus y squared is less than 5. So you solve this inside greater than equal to 0, or greater than 0, and that leaves you with this. One final example. For what value of c is the function f below continuous? Okay, so here's f of xy. It looks like an interesting function. Um, but if y is equal to 2 over x, you would end up with uh, 4 over x squared times x squared would be 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. And, of course, here you'd have 2 minus 2 is 0. So it's 0 over 0. It's not defined when y is equal to 2 over x. So we'll define it to be some constant when y is equal to 2 over x. And so the question is, what number should we set that function to be? And if we pick the right number, can the function be continuous? So the function's piecewise. Now let's look at the pieces. As long as y is not equal to 2 over x, this here will be a nice continuous function, similarly with that, and we won't be dividing by 0, so this will be a continuous function everywhere as long as that's not true. And the constant is always continuous, that's just a constant function. So in terms of the domain of this function, the pieces are continuous on their domains. It's just where the two pieces meet that we're really interested in a problem like cropping up. So is there a way to define c in such a way as to maintain the continuity at the points along y equals 2 over x? So let's try it. If y equals 2 over x, the function value is some constant. If it's not 2 over x, then this is the function value. We can factor the denominator like so. And as long as y is not equal to 2 over x, we can cancel these out. We're not dividing by 0, which means that this function is actually effectively equal to this function is effectively equal to this on that portion of the domain. Now, if you take the limit to some point where y is equal to 2 over x, so some point a comma 2 over a, x, y approaches that. Um, that's equivalent to taking this here. And this is just a nice function, so we can plug in a and 2 over a, so we get a and 2 over a, that means 1 over 2 plus 2, which is 1 fourth. But of course, this chunk of the function, if we take the limit along this domain, we just get c, and so what we want is c to be 1 fourth. And then that will make it into a continuous function. Okay, so I've entered the function in here, let's graph it. And... Uh, so let's find a point where y is equal to 2 over x. So say at the point 1, 2. If we zoom in here, we should get roughly a value of 1 fourth. And uh, to check that, maybe I'll just include the plane z, e z equals 1 fourth. Graph that plane. And it should slice through... right at the point 1, 2. Ah, yes, of course, at 1, 2, the function is not defined, but nearby, it does appear to be right on the edge. So I can't put in 1, 2 because the function is not defined, but if I get close there, it's approaching the plane 1 fourth, as you can see right there. Well, that's all I have for you. Thanks for listening and uh, I'll see you next time.